Hi there, it's Polly here. So, Helion Books, which is a history book publisher in the UK, The Thinking Man's Osprey, they have asked me to do uh, a massed battle combat system for the later samurai period in Japan, Sengoku period Japan. So, I have finished that commission. It's gone off to the publishers, and I uh, will just fill you in a little bit about it. So, it's called Heho, 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 which is the art of war, basically, the art of battle. Um, now, this covers that last sort of half century of warfare in Japan the 1560 through to sort of 1615 period. There's been a lot of technological shifts and so on happening in Japan over that era. Firearms have come in. There was a massive shift from essentially the samurai as mounted horse archers to an emphasis on infantry combat. Massive, massive changes in agricultural technologies had led to uh, a huge increase in the population population of Japan, which meant the armies were immensely bigger. And these armies are often way bigger than the ones you get in Europe at the time. And also the tactical systems that were in use in Japan at this time made for a type of warfare that's radically different from European. So there are lots and lots and lots of kind of Renaissance period rule sets out there, but they're all for European stuff. Um, and there's nothing that actually properly addresses warfare in Japan at the time. So, the commission and the idea was do something that actually showcases these differences and shows you a game that <clears throat> really makes those tactical differences and that environment shine. You know, it'll give you a very different gaming experience. So, <sighs> Japanese armies in this period uh, usually clan run. These clans tend to have uh, their own tactical systems and so on. They have their own, you know, uh, they, they have their own secret methods, but in general, it all levens out. Um, but the things that you will see coming through in the battle reports are their unit command and their tactics. The fact that some clans are renowned for having a certain sort of reputation. Um, some are renowned as being, you know, very ferocious, or some are very resolved, or some are very cunning, or some are um, very tenacious, or some are fast moving but tend not to have too much endurance. You know, these sorts of reputations actually stuck. Some were renowned for embracing certain technologies. So some clans moved heaven and earth to give everyone very, very solid um, cuirasses and armor and a lot of, and bulletproof armors. Others were renowned for having particularly long spears and using um, um, spear shock tactics with very, very long pikes. Um, others were renowned for being almost entirely mounted or others were renowned for having special tactics for um, putting off pursuers. So the other thing you get is reputations of individuals because there's a lot of people politics and a lot of personal um, personal skills and, and personality in a lot of the generals. So that has to shine through and also there's betrayal. Things like even at Sekigahara there are deployments made because they know some of these clans that make this alliance on each side are shaky and indeed <clears throat> the uh, Tokugawa side who won. Um, yeah, they Part of that victory was helped by a clan on the other side, basically, you know, betraying their lord and coming in on the Tokugawa side. So, this is an environment where infantry combat is king. Uh, Japan is extremely rough terrain. Um, there are extremely steeply sloped uh, mountains and, oddly enough, um, very few places where there are actually foothills that lead up to the mountains. Only dirt tracks, no big paved roads. The roads, the, you know, the, the mighty Takedo Road and so on are really just dirt walking tracks. So, 
cross-country wheeled th vehicles, carts and so on, just really not a thing. Um, it's too steep, it's too wild. Um, heavy cannon, not going to happen. Not going to happen. You're just not going to be able to move them around. And there's not that much region for, for, for play of um, you know massed cavalry armies and so on. But what the technology have shaken down to at the time is shock tactics for infantry. And the absolute weapon par excellence is um, the spear. So, the spear. Now, for samurai combatants, if you are a spear duelist, an expert, um, you're probably going to use like a, uh, a nagayari. You're probably going to use about a 12 foot long spear. It's probably going to have about 18 to almost 24 inch metal blade. The longer the blade, the better, because it's hard to damage the shaft when you are parrying with a sword and so on. But that length is, is handiest um, for a duelist style fight. It's got tons of reach. You can just monster swordsman. Trust me, I'm an expert in spear fencing. That is actually one of my things. Uh, and the armor penetration on a spear is stunning. Um, the full weight of the body and quite a barge pole of a weapon narrows behind this tiny point. It will punch through a breastplate. So it's it was quite a revelation. You can pack people in a lot tighter than you can using the Naginata, which was a cutting style halberd that had been previously been the main infantry weapon, which had served well for centuries when infantry were mostly kind of scattered groups of people acting in looser formation. But now you're trying to concentrate for shock action, the spear. Now, the other major development was, of course, massive expansion of these armies, which meant commoners. Commoners on the ground. Most of these armies are, in fact, commoners. So they have a, a lower, far lower skill level than the samurai. They haven't spent an entire life just, you know, training for one thing. The spear is a great weapon to equip these guys with because it doesn't take that long to bring someone up to um, moderate competence you know it can take a lifetime to make an expert swordsman but you make a good spearman out of someone fairly quickly yes there'll be experts who can you know beat these guys but you know minimal training can make formidable spearmen so foot soldiers given relatively simple armors some of them could be extensive but very often they're hardened leather mind you japanese hardened leather can be like a centimeter or two centimeters thick and yeah, it's good stuff. But these guys are going to be the bulk of your forces. So a Shiguru, the commoner foot soldiers, the spearmen who are a Shiguru are going to be a dominant force, but they're going to be backed up by missile fire. Now, bows actually reach the peak of their development at this point, just as they're being completely outmoded. Um, the lamination of the actual bow staves themselves had uh, gone through further development through the 14th centuries. By the 15th and 16th century, the final form of the Japanese bow comes out. It's more efficient than the earlier years. However, it's being replaced. It's being replaced by firearms. However, those bows are still useful. Uh, armor does give extremely good protection against arrows forget your kurosawa films where every arrow seems to be able to go through every set of armor no no people are recorded as being hit by dozens of arrows and still moving on you know because the armor will slow and you'll only penetrate that big and arrows don't actually have the stopping power that fantasy movies would make you think they do um but the thing is they're very good at essentially driving people into cover the speed of reloading makes them great harassing fire weapons uh, plus, you can sometimes use them under conditions where firearms are a bit difficult to use, like when it's really windy, blustery days and so on. But it's going to be bad for missile weapons. However, foot soldiers with um, bows, obviously an important part of the lineup. The new decisive factor that is starting to appear is the firearm. Now, Japanese firearms were adopted from the Portuguese uh, in 1524, I think, and rapidly produced locally and went through a evolution of their own. Japanese firearms are not copies of um, Portuguese arquebuses. Now, an arquebus is the precursor to 
a musket. So it has a relatively light bore, so it tends to be about a 16 gauge bore, 16 balls to the pound. Uh, and these are matchlocks, so they use a burning cord, which a trigger mechanism then puts into a pan, kablooey, off things go. The Japanese initially copied that general bore and the shorter, handier barrel length of the arquebus. In Europe, a heavier weapon developed called the musket, and that was because heavy armors for cuirassier cavalry and so on were able to withstand strikes from arquebuses. Um, and also, the longer barrel on a musket gave it monstrously more range than an arquebus. And you could just destroy archers. Um, the additional range and the sheer destructive power of a hit from a musket is so decisive that wherever muskets and arrows met, the musket troops won. Really is a decisive technology. In Japan, these aquabuses immediately made themselves felt. Um, you could attack armoured troops and you know, seriously use these as a shock weapon for essentially blowing a hole through so that your close combat troops like spears and so on could pour in. And you could also use it you know, in long range fire, lines versus lines. Very often uh, very useful for sieges. You could sweep um, battlements clear and uh, skirmishing and harassment. The Japanese were very, very quick to work on volley fire reloading systems that varied widely from school to school. Some of them were uh, ranked systems with you know, one rank kneeling, one rank um, standing. Others were all firing from kneeling. Others are reloading prone and popping up to fire with working in pairs, covering each other. Um, introduction and extraduction by lines. Um, there were some groups that worked on circulating fire systems. Um, many sophisticated drills appeared. But Japanese armourers went to work and came up with heavier armour that was resistant to those lighter bullets. Firearms then developed into heavier forms. Um which had a larger bore and a longer barrel, very much as we saw in Europe. Um, and these could defeat these heavier armors. They were also very beautifully made um, firearms that were used by samurai musketeers, uh, which were far more accurate, far more beautifully tooled weapons, um, but too expensive to uh, hand to common foot soldiers, but these were often used in bulk. So samurai musketeers became a thing. Likewise, there are samurai archers. They've got some skills. Uh, there are also these things called ozutsu, great, <laughs> great cylinders, which are like hand cannon. Uh, you get small groups of guys firing these things that look like, you know, literally titanic can things. Often these are firing like a, a giant wooden dart, which was could be set afire, so it was an incendiary weapon. Uh, it could have like a gunpowder or um, um, flare core, so it could set fire to flammables. But they could also be loaded with charges of musket balls or solid shot, so it can be used as a giant shotgun or as a um, you know um, uh, as a light cannon. Um, there are also light cannon. These tend to be about um, between half a pound and um, two pounders usually, and often they. The barrel seals into a box, which can then be carried on the back of a pack animal. And much like mountain guns in the um, Victorian era, when you bring these in, things to action, these things are unpacked and assembled and fired. It's a light support weapon, um, had its uses, not wildly decisive, but had its uses. Cavalry. Now, cavalry had evolved away from... Horse archers. Now, horse archery, armoured horse archery tactics often relied on essentially a line of infantry retainers as a sort of a, a, uh, a home zone. Groups of archers on horseback come thundering out, make fast-moving attack runs past the enemy, shower them with arrows, circulate in various different ways and drills that these guys had, but they have to take their horses back for a breather after making attack runs, so they tend to go behind the shelter of their own infantry. But another group has come out, to, so you have this constant circulating fire with people breathing their horses and reloading. 
but it keeps up a continuous fire, etc. It's not decisive, however. It pecks away at people. It causes a constant harassment. It isn't a decisive means of warfare. Cavalry evolved. So it evolved differently depending on the region. So in the Kanto district, which is the eastern regions, there is a lot more flat open plain areas. So here, shock cavalry evolved by equipping the troops with spears and having them move in closer formations, usually a couple of ranks deep. These could attack in an actual charge to sweep people away with shock action, um, which proved quite decisive. In the western areas, they tend not to be quite so shock-oriented, still often armed with um, spears, sometimes not as heavily armoured, but also they did have missile weapons within these what we'll call medium cavalry. It's not a shock cavalry, it is able to scout and skirmish and harass. Think of them a little bit more like Cossacks. Armoured, in fact, vicious Cossacks, but they are willing to come out and do spoiling attacks, um, do lightning fast um, lunges to sweep away skirmishes before returning back to a main body. They're a very mobile uh, force, but they're not in any way intended to go shoulder to shoulder and charge someone. Now, these guys do have a smattering of bows amongst them very often, but they also used firearms. There is a shorter... Uh, version of the main musket. It's got about a, a two foot long barrel and some clans actually dedicatedly equipped their cavalry in the western regions with these carbines and the idea was to harass the enemy from horseback firing carbines. Um, there was also a pistol. Um, didn't see the too much use because it was a little it's a matchlock pistol it's a little bit clumsy but uh, definitely the carbines tend to be sewn in amongst these troops all of these cavalry are perfectly willing to dismount and fight on foot they're very different from european cavalry they will operate in regions you know that have a lot of close terrain and so on they're very very happy to leap off the horses and operate as you know heavy infantry at the drop of a hat they also have retainers with them. They're a little bit like European knights in that certainly you've got these beautifully equipped samurai, but there are slightly lesser equipped retainers as a backup. Often these guys may have missile weapons as well. Um, but these lesser armed troops are also very willing to uh, jump down onto foot and make a steady line for skirmish to operate from or follow up a cavalry shock action with a charge on foot or charge on foot to cause disruption which the cavalry they are paired with can then exploit. Samurai on foot are also definitely a, a thing. You are fielding these guys. They have shorter weapons than the long spears and so on usually used by the rank-and-file commoner spearmen. Uh, very often, yeah, obviously, they're quite frequently sword experts, but also experts in spear fencing and so on, just not quite as encumbered with you know, these massive spears that you often see in the common foot. That expertise in very close combat is useful because what these guys are used for is not as a spearhead in combat, very seldom. They're used as a backup in combat. So the recommended thing was you would do attacks or defenses with your spearmen, and once the lines are engaged, your samurai will either do flanking attacks or they'll rush through your own lines to engage the enemy at very close quarters. So it was a, a, synthet a synthesis of the foot soldiers and the samurai. Likewise, the cavalry are, of course, recognised as being vital for following up when the enemy recoils or retreats. That's where you do your real damage, when the cavalry rolls over. So, how Japanese armies organise themselves is very different from European at this period. Um, the basic manoeuvre element is called a sonne. Now, a sonne you could probably describe as a brigade. 
It's somewhere between mm, somewhere between three hundred and a thousand um, men, probably on average five or six hundred guys. The sonnet that are run by particularly wealthy nobles and families or by important figures max out the manpower. They will they are noted as being quite large. They in fact can get quite quite large. They can, they can be you know, easily you know twelve hundred men. But each of these sonnet is actually a mixed arms brigade. So that kind of thing you get in in your typical war game where you've got a line of musk, you know, you've got units, these are this is my unit of musketeers, this is my unit of spearsmen, this is my unit of archers, does not exist in Japanese warfare. Not at all. A sonne is an organically created organization. It has its own supply chains and so on. It can operate on its own. It, they are always homogenous to a single clan. A clan may field several sonne, but a sonne is always made up from just one clan. It will ideally uh, include multiple arms of service. So, kind of in a way, your ideal one is to have musket armed troops or firearm armed troops. That's your firepower. They can disrupt the enemy line or hold off enemy musketeers and so on. You can have archers. That's their job is not to stand and fire as archers. They are purely supports for the musket line. Some armies attached one or two archers for every five musketeers within the musket line. Others had dedicated subunits of archers that were positioned to support the musket line. But the idea is they are there to harass the enemy musket line and interfere with their reloading um, by making people you know duck and dodge these damned arrows. So you didn't have to have many, and there aren't many actually on the battlefields, but they do still exist and they are important. You can have light cannon attached, or ozutsu, those honking great big <laughs> mega shotguns. Um, don't have to, they're fairly specialised and there's not many of them, but you might have those. Spearmen, definitely commoner spearsmen are going to be at the heart of this thing. Heavy infantry samurai on foot to back up those spearsmen. If you can do it, if you've got the numbers of samurai, obviously that makes your infantry shock way more effective. And cavalry, often at the back of the sonne, held in reserve, to either do flanking attacks during an action or to do follow-up and overrun the enemy if they recoil and you've beaten them. But they can also be split off to do spoiling attacks as an enemy sonne attacks. Uh, you can attempt to try and um, overrun the other guy's musket line. Cavalry are very good at overrunning musket lines. Um, so you get this organic tactical unit that have quite elaborate tactical systems for sonne and how they face other sonne. There are different patterns of attack. Um, you can form as essentially um, concentrated attack. You might form those spearsmen into a, a phalanx. More often you'll form them into an arrowhead with heavy infantry, samurai locked in behind them, ready to push through. Um, you might have archer units positioned on the wings to support a scattering of musketeers out the front with more concentrated musket units uh, and you know cavalry out the back. Or you might be leading off with your cavalry, um, seeking to you know, smash and disrupt the enemy lines and shake them so a concentrated infantry charge can go through. You can have quite complicated attack patterns where they've got like different units um, doing um, pinning attacks and then flanking attacks and so on. That's an alternative to just sort of these you know dedicated forceful attack plans. Likewise, um, there are defensive plans as well, different formations. Some are designed to basically break the enemy on a wall, concentrate your spears together shoulder to shoulder. You can um, you know, hold off cavalry. Um, but you might also want to pull troops off to the side and try and withdraw spearsmen and try and sucker the enemy to come in to you know, a killing zone, which you can then flank. Or you may have an active defense where you're sending out little spoiling attacks to disrupt, and then you're actually going to then do a counter-attack. So, quite sophisticated systems. 
obviously, given the size of the armies, you can't have those perfect sonnet all the time, particularly an army that's massively expanded. You'll find that there aren't that many samurai to go around, which means the only cavalry there are samurai, because horses are expensive and only samurai have got them. If you wanted to do a lot of mounted action and have a lot of mounted troops, that means you're sacrificing the samurai infantry you can have. Now, if you want samurai musketeers who are very efficient in that musket line, those are samurai that aren't fighting as heavy infantry supporting the spear line. And if you've got samurai heavy infantry and musketeers out there, then you haven't got samurai operating as cavalry in the back line. The units that you are you think of as like mighty cavalry sweeps, they actually almost don't exist. There are almost never pure cavalry sonne. For one thing, as I said, the cavalry are perfectly willing to dismount, so they're actually like I'm willing to become you know, infantry at the drop of a hat. But they are very, very frequently brigaded with infantry. Um, at minimum something with firepower um, but they may also just have shock infantry like spear and the idea is to you know combine infantry shock action and cavalry shock action or the medium cavalry medium cavalry harassment ability and the skirmish and firepower ability of a musket and archer line so lots of tactical choices here in the tactical makeup of your sonne. You could have something that's just all musket, which is what they did. They stripped the firearms troops out of a lot of different groups, and we're going to make a dedicated, essentially, musket and maybe archer sonne, whose job is skirmishing and firepower in an area. So, you know, you can strip things out. Likewise, sometimes they strip all the spearmen out. We're just going to make these concentrated spear shock um, sonne for holding areas or for, you know, <laughs> maniacal attacks so that's what these rules had to simulate so you will take a clan you can generate or an army is actually a collection of sonnes and the sonnes uh, as I said can come from more than one clan so the basic idea is you you have an army it draws its elements from one or more clans which you can randomise how many clans that you have to deal with you can randomize a character for each of these clans. Uh, a little chart, you know, gives you these guys are famous horsemen. These guys, these guys are, you know, quite famous as archers. These guys have heavy armor. These guys are very swift. These sorts of things. Then what we get is you have to start finding your personalities of your sub commanders. You get um, a main general. You can choose, are you leading from the saddle? That means you've got basically a general on horseback with a mounted um, staff, and you, that person roams about the battlefield, handling things and putting out fires right there. Or are you leading from the camp? You have a enclosure, and you have staff, and you have networks of quarries who bring you news, and you have a series of contingency plans and so on. This is... Both styles were used. Uh, often leading from the saddle is great if it's difficult terrain or um, um, you're on the march, um, but um, both have their pros and cons. Uh, in the game, what happens is you can kind of pre-book extra actions for your troops if you're leading from the enclosure. Whereas the guy who's leading from the saddle gets the idea ability to personally intervene and issue orders on the spot. However, because he's up there in Danger County, that general is potentially in danger. Uh, where ideally, if you've got like your leading from an enclosure, you've decided to place it somewhere fairly well protected. But those different styles are important and that kind of pre-booking your actions and so on can get quite interesting. Um, you, you pre-book all these extra activities um, that you, know, you, you, you can bring in. Uh, you design your sonne. Now, you get a set number of foot soldiers for um, your you've agreed on with your opponent. That's your basic strength. And you can use those as whatever. You can say these are firearm troops, spear troops, 
you have very limited resources of samurai. For every, I think, every three foot soldiers, you can have a samurai company. Now, a sonai is made from at least three and no more than five bases of troops. A base is basically a, a strip that's got more than one figure on it representing the troop types that are available in that sonai. So you declare this sonai has five bases. You take your budget of samurai and foot soldiers. And right, so this, this sonai is going to have two sonai of shot, one sonai, oh, sorry, two, sorry, two, two bases of shot, one base of spear, one base of samurai heavy infantry, and one base of cavalry. There we go. Now, the other thing you can do is you can trash in some of your bases of foot soldiers for elements, which is a little half base, which is a thing you can add to a sonne. Uh, that is, you can add archers to a sonne. That's a half element. So you trash in one base and you get two half elements. That will give you a bonus with your musket troops when they fire. You can uh, add in um, um, cannon and um, heavy firearms, the ozutsu. That's an element you can add. You can also add in supplies. Well-supplied groups also get a bonus on their musket fire. Um, so you can divvy things up this way as well. If a sonne falls uh, to only two bases, the sonne is combat ineffective and is removed from play. As you take casualties, you lose bases. So you will whittle these things down. And you sometimes have to choose which troops you are losing. Um, so hmm. um, when it's your turn, it's not a entirely you go, my go kind of thing. You, you basically form your um, sonne into effectively divisions, groups of sonne that move together under the command of um, leaders. When it is time for a new turn, one of these divisions on one side moves and then division from another side moves. However, there are opportunity movement rules which allow you to uh, interrupt the other guy's movement and do some movement and shooting of your own. Um, there's a whole command control system, which I'll briefly touch on in a minute, but what you are doing is issuing orders to your sonne. You can give them orders to attack. If you attack someone, you basically put a little counter down which says, are you doing a concentrated attack, like forming up those mighty battle wages and um, charging in, or are you doing a serried attack, which is a more complicated and subtle attack plan, but it's not quite as do or die. If it doesn't go well, you tend not to... Um, you know, get overrun so badly. Likewise, the defense has to guess a bit and say whether they're going to do a concentrated or a serried defense. The attacker can also simply declare that they are skirmishing, which means they just go through the firepower phase of a turn, but they do not attempt to close an attack. They're just basically trying to pick holes and see if they can um, shake the other line. Uh, if you have a serried defense against a concentrated attack, um, then you get a bonus. If you have a concentrated attack against a serried, uh, sorry, a concentrated defense against a serried attack, then um, you get a negative. But what happens is you can then um, re rearrange the order of the troops on your uh, in, within your sonne, showing what you're leading with. You then get a little firepower phase where, if the um, where leading bases of uh, firearm troops um, up to the first two ranks can begin to fire. Uh, there are some bonuses depending on whether you are archer support or if you are samurai musketeers or if you are very well um, equipped. You can you can do bases of casualties on the other side, which comes off their missile troops first. You're more likely to disrupt the other side and cause it to basically get a little marker on it saying that it has that unit has taken casualties and disruption, which makes it weaker in the combat to come. Um, once that's done, the troops that have fired, you basically move them aside and you can replace them in the sonne order however you wish. Once you've done that, the new lead on the sonne 
are the ones that fight each other in hand to hand. If you've got something like spears, but the base behind them, supporting them, is, say, heavy infantry samurai, they get a bonus. And there are sometimes bonuses, like if it's cavalry against you know, non-spears. And, and if it's spears um, on a um, uh, concentrated defense who are being attacked by cavalry, they get a bonus, etc. Very simple. You're not being laden down with things, but stacking this and figuring out who does what you're rolling you're rolling dice you're seeing who gets the most hits and whatever um if you get way more hits than the other side uh he has to lose a base um if the guy was disrupted from the firearms phase then um the attacker rolls extra dice one side or the other will lose um and they then will retreat back from the fight if the winner has cavalry as a rear rank that were not engaged in the combat, a recoiling uh, enemy will lose an extra base. So you'll do way more damage by having cavalry held in reserve up the back. So for instance, if you had a cavalry-based sonnet that you're thinking of, it's, it's best to basically have a cavalry unit at the rear, and then you might have like, musketeers and cavalry and you know um, up the front but you know you're going to deliberately keep one a fresh cavalry unit at the back whose entire job is pursued so anyway so those are the kind of you know choices that you're getting in combat you know you can stay back and skirmish with them but the rest of it eh, you're trying to figure out is he going to do a concentrated defense or a serried defense uh, am i leading with my cavalry uh which can be good but i haven't got much of them if i lose them then eh, then I, and also i don't get to use them in the pursuit eh, um these sort of questions a command and control system, the idea is essentially you can only concentrate on so many things. A general basically has um, some command points which represent effectively his attention, his ability to deal with crises and manage troops. So he's going to have a look around and uh, spend these points to move things however he wishes. He gives orders to these divisions and off they trot. However, if you don't have enough points to order all of your units, they will move according to way, the way they like to move. And that comes from the personalities of the generals that are running them. If you've got a very aggressive general, they will move forward to try and engage the nearest enemy. If you have a more cunning person, they will essentially skirmish, but they won't close with the enemy. They, you know, they're always looking for advantage, but they're a bit afraid to commit. Um, you've got other stubborn ones who will kind of dig in and defend. Um, and if you've got some that have got shaky loyalty, ah, this is where you know the, you, you might actually see them um, um, change sides. So that does mean you have to start putting the right personalities into the right positions. If you've got something like shock cavalry based Sone that you want to do mighty aggressive things, you can almost in a way let them go. Don't put any orders into them because they're just going to heat seek and do that thing that they're going to do anyway. However, if you want them to be more clever about it, you're going to have to spend the points and micromanage to stop them just, you know, heading off across the horizon and, um, you know, disappearing off to Dixie. Um, so it's a little bit like herding cats in that... Um, as the chaos of the battlefield builds up, there are more and more things to spend these command points on. You can spend command points to give yourself a bonus in combat because you are micromanaging that combat and they do better. But that gives you less points for ordering troops. You spend those things on attempting those points on attempting to rally troops as they recoil. You can actually bring back bases that were lost if you spend the points on them. You can spend these points on pushing extra movement into units um you know you're, you're urging them on you're you're um you're pushing them forward so the call on your commander's attention will escalate as the game goes on we get back to that whole thing of leading from the enclosure you've got some points beforehand that you can split up so you can try and anticipate beforehand when things are going to start heating up on the battlefield and pre-book more of these points to appear or if you're leading from the saddle of course you're racing back and forth and you're setting out fires and boldly leading the troops from the front so you know you you just get busier 
So um, once uh, an army loses a sizable proportion of its sonne, it will retreat uh, and pull back, and yay, there's a victor. So testing these out has been really interesting. It's got way more of a flavour like Napoleonic warfare with these kind of mixed divisions, or some of the kind of the later 19th century things like um, Franco-Prussian War, where you've got brigades that have got, you know, yes, you've got your infantry, but you've also got some attached cavalry, attached artillery. They're way more organic in the way they work. So the character that's coming through in this game is that organisation of the sonne, picking what role you want them to have and filling them with troops accordingly, the personalities of the different commanders and the characteristics of the different clans is and the command styles that and how they handle the escalating chaos of battle those are the three things that come through in these rules and uh, i think they come through really strongly it gives a very 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 different game to your usual renaissance war game no serried lines of troops you can set up in these very complex um, deployments that they used to love. You know, they would call a double envelopment to the Japanese because they're based on old 7th century Chinese military texture. This is this is Crane's Wings where, you know, I've got a central core, but I've got two groups that are trying to enfold. Or, you know, this is Half Moon Defense. Um, this is Carp Scales. You, know, you can actually do it on the battlefield. Um, and make sure that you've got fresh troops because you can leapfrog past Sonne as they start to falter and push forward with the fresh troops while you spend points to try and recover the damage on your damaged troops. Um, you know, you're going to have to actually fight this like a real battle and um, not like a pair of, you know, rows of pretty painted soldiers smacking into each other. It's very it's very tactical as these different Sonne are... Um, moving and supporting and uh, um, zigzagging back and forth across the battlefield. I set the thing up so that you can play it on a battlefield that is divided into square grids, because that's simple. But the rules also allow you to play it on a normal unmarked tabletop in the the usual fashion, whichever way you prefer. Um, take your pick. So... Um, it's going to look magnificent with six mil figures. Absolutely magnificent. It's going to look like a real army. Because these armies, remember at Sekigahara, the armies that go in the march are about 160,000 men. These armies are bigger than the armies at Waterloo. The final clash at Sekigahara, there's about 80,000 men per side. Um, 80, 80 to 110,000 a side. Um, so these are these can be huge armies. At Kawanakajima, smaller battles like 4th Kawanakajima, I think there's about 24,000 a side. Still pretty big. Remember, these are the late 1500s. If you go to the big, big battles that are happening in Spain at the time, there's only like 8,000 um, troops per side. So even at their smallest, these are three times the size of European battles. So it needed a bigger vision Um it's, it's got more of a sweep. So that's what I've cooked up. Um, Heho, the art of war. Coming from Helion, um, they're working on the editing and so on. Um, this is designed for any scale of troops. Um, English players are very fond of their 28s. Um, I think you probably need to get a couple of extra jobs in order to be able to afford 28 mil armies these days. But uh, these will work with 28s perfectly um they work splendidly with 15s and many of us have 15 mil troops from other systems which is great just trot them out and they're in this you'll be able to use the same bases you've used for any other games you've played um not a problem um they'll also look fantastic in six mil or even two mil um so take your pick play your way and try playing try playing hey ho a very different game that gives a very that simulates a type of warfare that has not been properly served by war games rules before it really hasn't uh, this is unique <sighs> that was the job i was asked to do uh, i'm a i'm a historian of the history of japan uh, i am a 
old, old, old student of Japanese Kobudo, which are the old, oldest Japanese martial arts and so on. It was an honor to be asked to do this. It was a thrill to do the uh, the thing. And as a games designer, it was a real challenge. And I, th I think I've cooked up something unique. And what's more, I think I've cooked up something that gives a real flavor of a period that is spectacular. Anyway, thanks for listening in. This is, game will be coming out uh, probably, I think they're going to bring it out for the end of the year. Um, there's a lot of page layout and a lot of um, photographing of models and battles and so on to be done. Um, they definitely want out, out for Salute next year, which salutes the big miniatures convention over in, in Britain. <sighs> so uh, I will keep going. Helion have asked me to do some more material for them. Um, sounds like they want me to do, actually do a history of... Um, uh, a history of that whole Sengoku period Japan, which is interesting, you know. So, uh, yeah, they've, they've said you're a recognized expert in this field, so, all right, thanks, guys. Um, hey, might do you a samurai history book that's not written by Stephen Turnbull. <laughs> Stephen, if you're out there, love your work, man, love your work. Anyway, I hope to see everyone around the gaming table sometime. Cheers. <laughs>